uh, this is No Bullshit Gaming Podcast, two and a half gamers um, special scan session today. So we are sharing actionable insights, uh, dropping knowledge from our day-to-day -day user acquisition, game design, and ad monetization jobs. So today it's only day-to-day -day user acquisition jobs. We're definitely not discussing latest news, uh, but we are having so much fun. So let's not forget, this is still 4 a.m. conference discussion vibe, so let's not take it too seriously. So again, as I said, this is special scan iOS session with Aaron Friedman. So as you know, as you might notice, I replaced Felix and Jakub uh, with Aaron because, well, he's definitely more, suit most, more suitable for any iOS or scan uh, discussion. And it's me, Matej Lancaric. So, Aaron, welcome. Thank you for having me, Matej. And uh, yeah, I'm happy yeah. to join as the, one of the players uh, there, one of the gamers, and uh, excited to uh, talk about uh, no bullshit insights for Scan. Nice. Sure. Yeah, yeah, perfect. That, that's what we need because we. Uh, so we have all the all the articles out there talking about how Scan 4.0 is coming. Nobody knows when. Maybe we know already. Let's see. And you are kind of, you know, in the in the let's let's go back channel because well, I, why why don't you just um, give us some like quick introduction from your side, uh, who you are, how did you end up in gaming as well? It's it's always important mm -hmm. important and in interesting to know. Yeah, sure. Um... Okay, so first of all, uh, my name is Iran. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Singular. Um, you know, we started the company almost 10 years ago now. As a, nice. As a, yeah, so that's uh, been a while. Uh, started as kind of the first cost segregation solution in the mobile industry, as we called it originally. And then very quickly, we got into the MMP space. We wanted to kind of build the ultimate unified solution to provide all the UA data from all your networks with all your attribution yeah. data, kind of in a single platform. Um, you know, we're uh, ranked uh, just uh, recently in uh, G2 as the number one product for MMP in the, uh, in the category. And we work with amazing gaming companies like, nice. like uh, EEA and Blue and Riot Games and Rovio and Warner Brothers and many, many others, of course. And uh, we're kind of putting a kind of a big focus on next generation uh, attribution methodologies like SK Network and Privacy Sandbox and Media Mix Modeling and all of that jazz. Um, but then, so that's nice. kind of, I guess, where we are today. And you're asking like, how did you get to the gaming business? So honestly, I started from kind of the mobile industry in my career. So before mm. Singular, me and my two other co-founders, Gadi and Susan, we all worked at a, a subscription app, I would say, not exactly yeah, okay. gaming, but the consumer app uh, called Unavo that was way, way back when all kind of, this was 2009, so really when the mobile industry kind of exploded. Um, so we kind of saw the challenges around growth and growth data from there, and I think that's what inspired us to uh, start Singular. Um, but yeah, I mean, since then we've like been we've had like customers who are also uh, uh, gaming uh, as part of like the mm -hmm. level. We had like a small B two B business that we're interacting with yeah. them, and uh, then uh, we kind of started a new company and wanted to focus on you know solving growth data challenges basically. So I guess that's what brought me into the gaming industry. Uh, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, that's pretty cool. And uh, so why you are here. So as soon as ATT happened and all these privacy changes happened, Singular was like mo like one of the most vocal MMPs out there. So I, I remember you were like always talking about what's what's happening, just sharing some, some insights and some knowledge. Uh, so this is good. I, I, I love it. And I have some some really like, let's let's call them direct questions because um mm -hmm. i read a lot of articles but i still get it. I'm, I'm getting also questions like okay so what should we do when should we start uh using the scan 4.0 but before we go yeah. there can you just maybe quickly uh give us some a like, quick state of the ios like what's happening now of course everybody knows like itt all this uh, fun stuff but like mm -hmm. now okay so we need to move from scan 3 to scan 4 do you have any maybe timelines or something that you can share? You can you, you know from the from the back uh, background, and also maybe I I'm, I can un ask after all this iOS uh, fun stuff, just privacy sandbox as well. You mentioned it, so maybe we'll go yeah. there. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. But what do you, what you are seeing yeah. now from the like the iOS point of view? Okay, so let's uh, take a 
quick kind of step back and like kind of say, okay, what's the state of the industry with iOS at the moment? And you were yeah. already familiar with the APT changes, you know, the lack of IDFA or the you know discussions like probabilistic versus system realistic mm-hmm. and all that things. And then there's SK Network. And again, probably everyone is already familiar with the fact that Apple kind of designed SK Network to work across all iOS users without requiring the ATT pop-up or without you know demanding kind of either they give consent or not, doesn't matter. Everything works on SK Network. And that was kind of the initial, you know, the originally released it like yeah. a SK Network 2.0, <laughs> like two years ago with a lot yeah. of drama as, uh, as you've mentioned. And yes, we're pretty, uh, I think, uh, vocal about the need to kind of prefer it. And they've made changes through time. They've added like published new versions and added more features. There's like SK Network 2.1 and then 2.2 and then 3.0. Like things have evolved since then. And if I kind of fast forward to now or more specifically to like November of just last year, yeah. then suddenly Apple released the new version of SK Network called SK Network 4.0 or Scan4 in short. Uh, it was actually also a kind of a surprise a bit for the industry because there, there <laughs> are already kind of gave teasers everything. on. <laughs> yeah, like always with yeah. Apple, you know, it's uh, fun. So they were kind of giving teasers on kind of it's going to happen, it's kind of four, going to have some new features. But then suddenly out of the blue, they said iOS 16.1 is out. And happy surprise, it includes Scan4 in it and tons of documentation of changes and differences and new features and all of that. <laughs> uh, so that was uh, just before the holiday season. So it was kind of great, uh, uh, you know, yeah. great uh, uh, kind of interesting timing and all of that. So uh, that was kind of, again, November of last year. Mm. Um, so then when you ask, okay, so, okay, so what's the status right now? Right now we're in February, 2023. Okay, so what's exactly the status? So the status, first of all, scan for is out. It's part of iOS yeah. 16.1 and above. Um, it's important, of course, to know that uh, because it depends on the OS version, then you need iOS users to update to iOS 16.1 yeah. so they'll have scan for supported. Um, already based on kind of the uh, adoption rates that yeah. I see. Let, so we let see me it. check well, what kind of yeah. uh, iOS I have at the moment because I'm always the uh, last to, to update. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. 100%. I don't, yeah, yep. I don't even know what. 6.1, okay, 6.11, okay. Okay, there you go. So I guess, so I guess there you go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's definitely growing. Um, based on our data, we see that roughly 45% of iOS users have 16.1 and above. Uh, so okay. it's still not like the masses, but you know, it's pretty man for almost but, half yeah, of iOS 45% users already have it. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty it's, decent, right? So, you know, roughly one of every two kind of iOS users would have scan for built in. And it's increasing like pretty fast. Like from November, it got yeah. to... What we expect that probably in the next, I don't know, three months or so, you'll have like probably like 80% of the users, which is kind of what you usually see uh, in, uh, in these yeah. uh, timelines. Okay. Um, so that's kind of one part that you need for Scan4 to work. Yeah. But then, of course, there is uh, like there's multiple endpoints that uh, need to work. There's the MMP side to support all the like infrastructure for the advertisers and the measurements. Yeah. Uh, I think by now, all the MMPs have released your scan for support and announce these. Uh, yeah, you were, also that... the, you were also the first one, right? Like, oh, well, we, have, we are live on scan 4.0. <laughs> but then I was I was yep. reading the, the fine print at the end. It's like, but, you know, like we are ready. But it, it's not, the adoption rate is not uh, very big. But we are ready. So as soon as every, everybody else is ready, you're good. <laughs> you're completely right. Like... You know, it's the no bullshit <laughs> podcast, right? So it's completely right. <laughs> Yeah. So we basically announced that was in November, right? Just shortly yeah. after yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, it was announced. And honestly, we've been preparing for that kind of release by Apple. So it's not mm-hmm. like we suddenly developed everything in like uh, two weeks. But yeah, we kind of yeah, yeah, okay. Bring all the initial things. But yes, you're right that the stages basically means that we have our scan for SDK that the advertiser mm-hmm. can update to be ready okay. for scan for. It doesn't mean that obviously they can run scan for SK because you need all the iOS yeah. users to add it to scan for and you need the networks to support scan for. But mm. this was really important for many of our customers because if you ima- can imagine, I've mentioned some of the kind of brands working with singular kind of in the past, yeah. like Warner Brothers and EA and these. It takes a while for all the studios to update yeah, their SDK for, for scan for, right? For these like, big companies, I'm pretty sure, yeah, it takes ages to get out with the, with the exactly. new SDK. Exactly. So it was really yeah, okay. good news for them to understand, okay, how they're going to involve it in the release cycles to make sure that 
once Scan4 is actually live and like production level, mm -hmm. they can be the first ones to kind of test it out, mm. right? Um, yeah. I think that was kind of the intention there. Um, and I think if, again, fast forwarding to now from November, now we're actually seeing, so again, not production scale in Scan4, but we already see live pulsebacks. Some, yeah. some ad networks are already testing it out and we're kind of coordinating nice. with them. We have some live advertisers, customers who are working with Scan4, actually seeing the data, which is pretty exciting, honestly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, starting to look how it's uh, working in practice, yeah. even if okay, tests, so, but so still the, cool. Yeah, yeah, the question is like, what's the, what's the advantage of being the early adopter of all of this? <laughs> Because it's so <laughs> complex. It's so complex. Yeah, completely agree. And you know, it's a good question to ask. Not all of the advertisers, and probably even not most of the advertisers, it would kind of fit for them to kind of be an early adopter yeah. and like be a first mover. But again, you kind of, uh, you know, in, the, in our industry, you see kind of various types of advertisers. Some say, you know, I have like a... I don't know, like an existing operation and got it to work in Scanty or whatever. I'm not really using Scan, which also uh, happens and say, yep. I prefer not to like test all the new features. I want to wait for things to stabilize. I want to kind of release everything, give give it another like six months or a year. And then kind yeah. of I'll, understand, I'll <laughs> get all the learnings, read all the blog posts and do what everyone else is doing, right? So yeah. that's definitely a, a, a legitimate strategy and makes sense for maybe most of the advertisers. But we do have some of our customers who actually want, love being on the cutting edge of technology, right? Yeah. They want to be the first ones to test this. They want to get the advantage. They want to, we know that there's going to be a learning curve. Like there was a learning curve for the initial versions of Scan. Yeah. And many were starting for a lot of time. We saw that honestly, the ones who started early got the struggles like everyone else, like trying to figure it out. But honestly, <laughs> they've, uh, now they feel, I guess they got to a better place much, much earlier than others, and they further it yeah. works to their advantage. It means they can, you know, yeah. buy uh, uh, IDFA less inventory, which is usually cheaper than IDFA based inventory, yeah. and they feel that they can optimize there, right? Or like yeah. do uh, things I mean, that yeah, others that can't do during during the time. Yeah, that that's true. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, I mean, uh, I'm usually not as uh, as early adopter as. Maybe I would like, but uh depends on what kind of companies I work with. Of course, if I work with smaller companies, not everybody has the resources and everything to actually crack the, like what does it mean? So yeah. it's like I'm oh, sometimes I'm play playing the the wait and see game. But mm -hmm. so you 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 talk about testing. So is it possible to have scan free in place and then start testing scan four on let's say partial traffic? Yes. So the answer is, first of all, yes. And okay. it's also necessary because we understand yeah. that it's going to be a gradual process. You're still mm. always going to have, like, even when Scan4 reached, like, mass adoption, you have, like, 80% users in Scan4, right? You're still going to have, like, the 20% in Scan3. So even yeah. during the time, you still need to maintain the Scan3 mm. models, in a sense. Now, Apple was pretty smart about it. They kind of put various uh, kind of backward compatible features in every new features that they've included mm. in Scan4. So anything there or like almost everything there can kind of be equivalent to Scan3, just like less mm. features in Scan3 in a way. Okay. So uh, we've also designed our you know solution to basically have parallel Scan3 and Scan4 so that if you have a Scan3 user, everything is going to work based on Scan3, of course. And if you have a Scan4 user, then you'll get kind of the additional features uh, for them. Uh, okay. Definitely complicates things, but it's probably going to be like that for a while. Yeah. Look, so that's what I, I always say to to people in in gaming industry. Like, it's not going to get any easier. It's going to get even more, even harder these days. It's yeah. like, yeah. but that's how it is. You just, we just need yeah. to adapt. But what's the then? So we are already kind of comparing scan free and scan four. So what's the biggest difference between scan free and scan four? Hmm. Wow. What's the biggest difference between Scan3 and Scan4? Um, yeah. So I think, you know, there's a lot of things that I'm personally <laughs> excited about, but let's, so there's like several big, uh, you know, differences or like features, I would say. So uh, yeah. if you think about it, there's like the web to app support, um, you know, which is really interesting because think about it, like to, until now, they're like UA channels, which were heavy from web that couldn't work with scan, just inventory not coming yeah. in scan, or can't be measured in scan. I don't know, think about search campaigns, 
like, I don't know, there's like all kinds of, you know, ad networks with heavy search traffic that you can imagine that maybe would be more based from browsers, basically, and couldn't be measured by scan. And it's possible, which is exciting on its own, right? There's the, there's features for getting like more granularity, so kind of getting deeper reports. It's for higher scale uh, advertisers, but potentially they can get like ad set level data, maybe creative level data, maybe placement level data. So that's kind of interesting on its own. Uh, just like the course values that we can probably yeah. talk about. But the thing that yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. the most excited about among other features I think has the biggest potential for being a game changer is mm -hmm. the multiple post backs. Uh, the fact that yeah. now for every user, you can get up to three different post backs in different uh, uh, court periods. And I think that's the most exciting ones uh, for me. Okay, so what are what are the different post ways and how does the um, the vin like the conversion windows look for these post packs? Because I was reading all these like uh, the first blog is like, hmm, okay, this is nice, it's great, but then like right now I'm used to see the um, the conversions and post packs pretty quickly. So we are looking at day one, so I can see very quickly everything that's that's happening. This it kind of extends to fucking eternity almost so like how does that look how does that look like because now it's it's not one only so that's going to be going to be free right so how does yep. it look like okay um, i mean it's great yeah but, uh, no it's yeah so i think yeah you know if, if we're kind of question, wait is it good thing it's a bad thing definitely there's no question scan for is definitely an upgrade from what we had in scan yeah. three um, but okay, but how it actually looks like. So let's uh, talk a bit about like the timer mechanism and like the, the postbacks and, and all of that. So until yeah. basically until scan version three, you only get single postback, right? For every attributed user. Um, and that could, and if you pass kind of, you know, a third in volume, then you also get like a conversion value and all of that. So we're kind of understand like the privacy thresholds and all that. So essentially, if you have a conversion value, then you can ideally calculate like your ROS for that campaign, right? Yeah. So you get kind of that post back and you can calculate like the encoded ROS. Uh, so if I try to uh, um, kind of make an example, let's say that I don't know, a user made a purchase after they insert the app and kind of played the game for a bit and they I don't know, like uh, made a purchase of like $5, then it's encoded as a conversion value of five and included yeah. in that post back and you can calculate your ROS, which is great. But the big issue, and in my opinion, in my personal opinion, one of the biggest issues in SK Network until now was the limited time window. You could only, yeah. basically, you know, there's like, a, we can get into the technical uh, details, but uh, the standard was to only uh, record what happened in the first day of the game yeah. from the first launch, right? So you have 24 hours to see if any users made any in a purchase or if they had any signals, you know, meaningful event that, makes you predict that they'll probably make an app purchase later on, right? Yeah. But uh, as we probably all know in kind of the gaming industry, especially for ones who uh, rely a lot on in-app purchase, there's barely any users who would be willing to make a yeah. purchase already in the first 24 hours, right? Um, and that's a big problem. That's like a huge problem for a scan. And I mean, for like, for like mid-core, for hardcore, games, for yeah. casual. Yeah, majority of games. That's a big issue. Um, so, um, so it's true that you get a post back pretty early on, but if you get like, you know, 90% uh, zeros of like users didn't make a purchase and then like barely yeah. working with values, it's like, how can you understand the true performance of your campaigns, right? So that's been, uh, and honestly, I've heard from advertisers who are kind of saying, yeah, sitting on the fence and saying, yeah, I'm not even sure if I can, if I should invest in scan in general, because I can't really see anything from beyond like uh, one day, right? So yeah. that was kind but of, it's I always, think you that know, was, this yeah. That's also uh, only um, like way of looking at things. Obviously, you want to know like what's uh, what kind of performance you are getting from the campaigns. Yeah, well, in these days, uh, especially on iOS, it's not going to be that easy anymore. So maybe it's kind of for okay, I'm, I'm gonna well change my uh, ter <laughs> terminology about these things. But then it's kind of you need to change the the way of thinking about the valuation of the iOS campaigns. And of course, like if you can't see, then it's really hard to kind of justify the, the spend, of course. But then yeah, you have different exactly. approaches to, you know, to look at things like blended approach. Of course, if you're a small company, money goes in, money goes out. Of course, it's not ideal. Exactly. It's very yeah. far from ideal. 
But what can you do? Yeah, but if, <laughs> yeah. So if you're running, you know, with like 10 channels, right, for a large scale yeah, advertiser, now suddenly the blended metrics are more difficult to... Yeah, exactly. So what yeah. can you do? <laughs> but now that's the big news in scale four, you know, because it's, you know, it feels like, to, to me, kind of from my perspective, it feels like Apple understood, recognized this issue. And they came up with like a new, a new proposal and basically said, yeah. now you're going to have three specific windows and they chose the windows themselves. It said, yeah, first course. post back, yeah, which was kind of interesting. Yes, of course. So it said, first post back <laughs> sent after two days with some random there. We can dive into the details. Then second yeah. post back after seven days with some random. And then third post back after 35 days. Uh, and those can have a course conversion value themselves. So now if I try to, again, like to look at it, think about it as from a gaming kind of publisher standpoint. Now, literally, if I had any in a purchase, in the first 35 days of playing the game, which sounds more reasonable for many of the gaming uh, companies out there now, then suddenly you can actually include, you can know exactly how many users made a purchase and whether this was high purchases or medium purchases and really see kind of the, like the 35 rods, right? Basically not yeah. very different. It's not, not like I'm seeing like yeah, D90, not day, but D35 but still, is it's pretty not day one. decent. <laughs> yeah, it's it not day one, one. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, so I think that can be, I know also from speaking with our customers, that's, that makes a huge uh, impact, right, on their analysis. So I think that's, that's kind of the big uh, news there. Of course, as always, like uh, I tend to say, like with, uh, with SK Network, there's always good news and bad news. So the yeah. good news are that you, <laughs> yeah, you're getting three postbacks, you're getting two days, seven days, and 35 days. That's great. The bad news are <laughs> that the second and third postback have much more random to them. So... The postback is sent after if the first postback was, we used to kind of get it between like one and two days, basically, of random. Yeah. Now, the second and third postback, we can get it after between one and six days of random. <laughs> so again, <laughs> so if the user kind of made a purchase after seven days and you get that conversion value, then it can take up to another six days until yeah. you get that postback, which is pretty insane. <laughs> but you know, that's what yeah, you exactly. have to work with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. So we need to now uh, think about how actionable is this actually for the UI managers, because of course, it's not only day one, but then like if, if I need to wait another like six, well, it's not only six days, 12 days, and then another X, X days to actually see the, the post back. Well, I need to be able to make decisions very quickly because, you know, I don't want to waste money. I'm pretty sure that you are hearing this from, from other advertisers as well. So uh, any any anything that you know can help you actually lock these windows or or um, the conversion values or that because I'm pretty sure that there is something uh, something in there. It can't be just doom and gloom only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's also the locking mechanism that I can dive in in a second. But I think yeah. if you think for a second about like the UA uh, uh, kind of. Uh, methodology and practice and even before like scan and idf pre-ntt right so the gold yeah. old days right usually <laughs> you start the campaign <laughs> yeah you kind of already in the first like few days probably you'll see like what's the initial performance right you look at yeah. d1 d2 d3 kind of performance and kind of make you know if you see like it's total trap like this campaign like not performing well you can decide yeah. to stop it if you see that it has some potential you'll probably you know, maybe make some adjustments, but kind of still monitor, right? You want to see what happens in day seven and day 30 and so forth, right? So kind of you rely on the first initial indicators to kind of mm -hmm. make more real-time decisions or like daily decisions, yeah. but still monitor what happens eventually, right, with, with that campaign. So if we think about it that way, it's I don't think it's going to be very different now with Scan4 mm -hmm. because you can imagine, you can still rely on the first post back. We're going to talk about even deeper optimization yeah. with lock windows. But if I don't change anything, yeah. I can check yeah. what happened after two days, okay? How much information I got from, from that? Like, the, how does the initial conversion look like? If I get like, I see like a full conversion value, I can see the fine conversion value, I see a lot more details there. And say, okay, if that campaign seems to be performing well or not, then you can decide to scale it or not. But then after yeah. seven or 35 days, similar as before, similar as the old days, you can take another look at that campaign for that install date and see, okay, did that campaign really continue to increase? Did the users really make a purchase as I mm. thought that they would? Or did they yeah, increase okay. in value as I thought that they would? Kind of validating your assumptions in, in a way. I think True, that okay. way of that process is still valid. 
in the new days. It is, but then how how the let's say reporting changes afterwards? Because now I'm I'm used to see the day one, but then and uh, yeah, how how does the reporting change uh, thanks to the the different conversion right uh, or post? So think about yeah, we when we're trying to think about our reporting for our customers and how to make it as yeah. easy as possible. We're, <laughs> everything is already so complicated and uh, that exactly so, yeah you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to, okay, keep it simple for the customer. So how it would show up in the reporting is what they can see is already, they see the day two, basically performance or like the first post back performance, yeah. which is okay. essentially day two, unless you shorten that uh, window. You can see day yeah. seven performance. So you can see day seven was basically, and then you can see day 35 was, right? So okay, essentially think in, about it as like- Anything in between or only day uh, seven so, and day 35. So directly from the post banks, you can mm -hmm. get like the exact window. But okay. if you get a bit more sophisticated, you might be able to see uh, more things in between. Um, uh, and we can talk how? about about the locking windows and all of that. But okay. um, but uh, yeah. So essentially, just to kind of to simplify, you can see kind yeah. of the reporting. You see the deep granularity the as much as can for will uh, offer, and then day two, day seven, day thirty five. Are you saying, wait, but I want to see day 10. That just is an example, yeah. right? Or day three, for example. That's honestly more difficult with scan uh, today. Um, you can do, what you can do is, you know, one feature that was kind of included in scan for, again, one of the hidden surprises was the locking mechanism, a lock window, mm -hmm. uh, which is really interesting and has a lot of, kind of room for discussion and kind of brainstorming in the, the team and with uh, the media partners out there. So the lock window gives the option for the advertiser to decide that they don't need to, they don't want to wait for the end of the window. Mm. And they want to shorten it like in real time say, okay, I'm done. I'm not, I don't need to uh, wait for any more information about the user to uh, send the, to send the post back. So just as an example, let's say a use case would be if the user made a purchase, I would regard it as a high value user, just as an example, mm. right? Because yeah. I'm looking for the high value user. Now, so if the user made a purchase already in day 10, then I'm going to lock the window and send, don't, no need to wait for day 35. You can already send the post mm -hmm. back to the network, right? After okay. 10 days. So the advantage would be that the ad network would get the post backs earlier on. They don't need to wait 35 days for the third post yeah. back. The disadvantage is that it becomes more difficult to understand what's the install date for where this post back belongs. All right, so let me kind of oh, try to. Uh, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> kind of Christ. A... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, okay, yeah. so yeah, I guess you said, so there's good news and bad news. Fuck's sake. Yeah, uh, exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So if you, you know, uh, if you basically say, yeah, I'm going to send the post back whenever the user made a purchase. So the user can make a purchase anywhere between like day eight to day 35, right? Yeah. The third post back. So how do you know that literally you have like a range of like a full month from where the yeah, user yeah. kind of belongs, right? Which kind of created problems. So mm. I guess I, my point is there's a lot of potential. There's things that you can yeah. do maybe around modeling, which is something that we're heavily investing in, like trying to figure out those things. Um, the, at the end of the day, we want to provide like the install base, like when did you spend money? And what were yeah. your results? In as many cohorts as possible, in kind of the, as real time as possible, with the limitations that uh, exist there, right? Of course, there there are gonna be limitations. So so the, okay. So a user installs uh, the game today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He or she makes a purchase in let's say in first twenty four hours, the first post pack. Then uh, this player makes purchase again in five days, and then mm -hmm. again in twenty days. So mm -hmm. how can I track this evolution of his LTV in, in this like new scan four point Right. So um, the first thing to kind of keep in mind, we're trying to answer that question is uh, Apple made it very, very uh, um, uh, hard to track that specific user and understand, okay, that's, sure. I got a specific user who made these three purchases, right? Yeah. Instead, they're kind of thinking, they say, thinking from the other way around. Uh, for this campaign, how yes. many users did you get who made that amount of uh, you know, purchases, right? So if you try to sum up, that this is kind of a one kind of classic way to approach this, is if you sum up those purchases, three purchases within, like you said, like 20 days, sounds like a pretty good user, right? Especially if you come yeah. to the first, 
already in the first 24 hours, they already made a purchase. You know, so intuitively, I would mark this as probably a pretty high value user, right? So that means, yeah. okay, you got some a good, a good user there. So probably what they would do is create a model, a, a schema, conversion model schema, and basically says, and again, if they made uh, more than a total amount of purchases, I don't know if it all aggregates to like more than, I'm throwing out like $10, yeah. or if they mm-hmm. made more than a one purchase, for example, during the time period, you probably mark them as a high value user in the third post back. And if, if they made also a purchase in the first day in the kind of the second window, then they'll probably be considered a high value user in the first day in the, in the first post back and second post back. So what you'll get in the reporting is you so, show that you had one install in theory mm. and yep. they're high value in both like D2, D7, and 35. And you yep. can probably also model the, the RAWs basically based on that kind of estimating, okay, how much average on average revenue you got from high value users, right? And, have day seven and day 35. So using some estimations to say, okay, on average, I think because I saw that you had like a one install with like high, high, high there, then probably the DROS there is, I don't know, like that, you yeah. know, 10%, C- like 30% percent. or whatever. Exactly. So it 60%, can't let's be more, windows. let's be more positive. Let's be more positive. 60%. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep, exactly. Okay. So, um, so, but so how that's do you, kind of how what you can tag? expect based on the, Mm-hmm. Yeah, how do you take those players? Like you said, like I, I would say this is a high value player. Okay, so how would I do that? So you, what you would usually do is like create a schema in uh, like your MMP, like singular, and kind yeah. of say, okay, so uh, 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 so again, high value users are equal kind of that. If a user made more than that range of uh, value, then I would consider a high value user. That's encoded kind of in the conversion value. And then you see from this specific campaign, okay, I got the number of high value users and that's, that means that the ROS is 60%. Now yeah. you can try to make decisions about that campaign. Is it hitting your target? Do you expect that 60, is 60% a good value? To me, it sounds pretty good for that, uh, for that yeah. range. Then you can you know, consider, okay, let's continue scaling this campaign. Looking good, right? But if you see that they're not hitting the target, you're barely seeing, maybe you didn't see any high value user Okay, seems like something isn't working there, right? And you should probably kind of consider like other levers to optimize. Um, so so can, that's kind of the level I, of thinking I can imagine. Yeah. Okay. So can I have uh, like different conversion schemas for different prospects then in the four four point oh? How does definitely, it work? Yes. How, yeah, how does so, it, how does it work? <laughs> so yeah, just to make things more complicated, of course. Exactly. Yeah, actually yeah. Have, yeah. So you actually have <laughs> four different schemas if you think about it, because you have okay. the, for the first post back, you can get either a fine conversion value, which is the type of conversion value that we have today, the famous number between zero and 63. So that's, yep. that's supported only in the first post back. So you, okay. you basically, you'll probably keep the same model that you have today for scan three. That's probably gonna, gonna be the fine conversion value for scan four for the first post back. Hmm. Uh, but then you can also configure a coarse conversion value schema for the first post back. So for people who are, less familiar with all the blog posts about scan for kind of the new type of conversion value that has more limited information not the famous number between 0 and 63 yep. but uh, just basically a string just low medium or high just three options mm, okay so basically yeah, if, if you don't pass certain thresholds the privacy thresholds basically to get the fine conversion value you might still be able to get the coarse conversion value so that's another model that you can potentially configure in the first post back so you need to think about, okay, so in the first two days of the user, like understanding how to map these two numbers and also how to map these to low, medium, and high. Um, so that's kind of the second schema that you need to configure. And then for the second and third postbacks, you also need to configure two additional schemas. What's considered okay. a high, medium, low value user after seven days and what's considered a high, medium, low user after 35 days, which might be different mechanisms, right? You might say that if a user made a $10 purchase within seven days, they're considered high. But if yeah. they didn't make any other purchases by day 35, maybe you'd say that they're a medium value user, right? So it might be different rules based on the different yeah. time windows that you have. Okay. So let's say, uh, let's say I have the same conversion schema. Let's, let's call, well, I, let's, let's use your revenue schema. So first, uh, first uh, mm-hmm. 63 bits, uh, it's all revenue brackets. Mm-hmm. Then yep. for the first uh, post back, I have another brackets for, let's say, low, medium, and high. 
So I can go from, I don't know, let's call 64 to whatever, 200, because I know that in the next seven days from the day one, players can spend anything between 60 and $200. Mm-hmm. And then from seven day to 30 days, they can spend another $500. So I can put all the brackets mm-hmm. here from, let's say, 60 to 500. Yeah. Okay. That's definitely one possible schema that you can definitely configure. Um, okay. There's more, there's like 10, you can easily spend like an hour and like uh, converge more optimizations, but I'll give you like an example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you think about it, again, in the course side, Usually mm-hmm. there's a, we see that there's a huge effect of whether the user actually made any purchases versus mm-hmm. they didn't make it all. Because obviously in gaming, like most users don't make any purchases, yeah. right? Yeah. So kind of a recommended practices I would say is that like, this is a big factor. Like it's more, mm-hmm. it affects more whether they even made a purchase or not, rather than kind of what's the exact amount that they made. Yeah. So okay. I would say probably as a default, you would say that if the user didn't make any purchases, assuming you were talking only about revenue here, then yep. you're probably yeah, considered yeah. low and they'll probably be yep. low. Like also it's going to be pretty consistent after seven day, after 35 days, mm-hmm. low value users. And that's probably most of the users that you're going to get, right? Uh, didn't mm-hmm. make any purchases, they're a low value user. And then on the revenue ranges, okay, so how do you split? Like let's say the user made a purchase. How do you decide if they're a medium or a high? then hmm. that kind of the, depends a bit on how you regard, you know, usually if I try to think about it, the, the high is kind of reserved to the, I don't know, the way users in a sense, or like the really high value purchase mm-hmm. yep. by users. And you can probably create like sort of like a distribution um, kind of metric. You see like, you know, how many purchases do you usually get per user and kind of try to split it somewhere mm-hmm. in which you regard, okay, if I get, you know, just like, I'm just throwing a number, but if you get like a very low number of high value users, but they know, you know that they're very high value, yeah. it means that you probably want to continue spending on that campaign. So you need to kind of yeah. think about what's that number that makes you confident that, okay, wow, I'm getting some pretty high value users here. It's worth like uh, um, uh, working more with that campaign. It might be that $100 uh, revenue. It might be like a $50 revenue. It's, of it course, really yeah. depends on the vertical and all, and all that, right? Sure, sure, sure. Of course, that depends on the genre of the game as well. Okay, yeah. so in that case, like how that influences the the campaign optimization on the on on the UA channel side, because now I'm I'm used to see let's call let's let's uh, talk about Facebook. So I'm sending all the purchases uh, from the day one into the Facebook with the with the value, and then I'm pretty sure to see that uh, as soon as I send as many events as possible, the campaign gets more more events, more data points, and it kind of optimizes better. But yep. it's it's day one only. So if I'm going to send the day seven or day 30, like how that's going to change the, the whole well, optimization on the campaign side? Yeah. Are you already talking about that with the, with the channels? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, we're talking with uh, Arthur. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man, there's a lot of conversation there because uh, it's a really difficult problem, about. right? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. They're like they're, they're also trying to like figure out how how are they going to update on their optimization techniques. But I think again, the good news is that it's not like there's some nuances and like the timers and the things that have changed, but they're still going to get the same first post back as they used to get. So yeah, in terms of like the current optimization, it seems like it's not going to remove things, things are only going to get better because now besides optimization by the first post back, suddenly they can get more information later on, of course, that kind of reaffirms if they're on the right direction or not, right? So if I had to guess, and I think every media channel has their own kind of strategies for optimization, they're trying to, everyone is saying we have to test it at scale, we have to see how the data looks like and all that. There's tons of silly questions on how it's going to work at scale. But I think the common kind of uh, way of thinking is we can keep for now still optimized by the first post back as exists today. But now we're going to get a bit more signal on, you know, later on, on how did we truly perform? And everyone has like their own kind of, you know, prediction algorithms trying to understand from the initial yeah. signal whether they're going to perform or not. Now we kind of have like this um, validation, right? After yeah, seven okay. days or after 35 days, if mm. you're really right, if it, is, if it really looks like it, uh, you got it right. And I think 
that's probably going to be like the first phase of still optimizing by the first yeah. signals, but getting a bit more information to see if you're right or wrong. Uh, and from there, we'll see how they, they can innovate and kind of update their optimization accordingly. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It took only like <laughs> almost eternity for the UHLs to actually adapt to what's what's happening on the iOS side. So it's going to be yeah, very definitely. very interesting. But I'm looking forward. I'm always very optimistic about uh, any any change in terms of the iOS. Uh, but how how can developers actually prepare for for this? Like any anything um, for those that uh, you know updated the SDK, but sh- should they do anything on their end? Anything else? Any checklist or anything that uh, you know uh, <laughs> we go through? It's like okay, so I need to do this, 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 and that, and then I'm fine. I'm well yeah. prepared. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is a checklist. So let's uh, think about it for a second. So first of all, yes, we need to update the, the SDK. That's the number. That's the most important thing. And you don't have to yeah. do it like literally like today, like uh, shouting everyone. Yeah. To the SDK. You just need to time. make sure it's part of your plan to prepare, right? So and it's usually yeah. those release cycles and making sure that it's somewhere in the backlog of your dev team. Uh, so that's the most important thing. So once uh, any UA channel says, oh, we have scan for support, then you are you can test it out finally. Yeah, you're good to go. So that's number one. Okay. Exactly. The second thing that you can already kind of prefer things is think about, this is more planning. So think about yeah. how do you want to leverage both the course conversion values, again, how do you define the low, medium, and high users mm. and the multiple postbacks? So how would you define those users for each one of those time windows? It's as if you need to create three new schemas. Uh, you already had to think about one yeah. schema. Now you need to prepare yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think are the next kind of three other schemas? Now, I get a lot of questions from like advertisers, like what should be like the best uh, core schema for me? I have no idea. And you know, it's obviously something that we've put a lot of Think thought around and yeah, yeah, yeah. basically our product offers kind of out of the box schema. So you can use your keep your same scan three model that maybe you've mm. iterated and gotten something that you feel really confident about and kind of click a button or like you know uh, upgrade to scan four and we'll have uh, our suggestion for course conversion mm. values for our okay. three models. So you don't need to you know like obsess about like what's the right schema. You have something already available that's kind of aligned with your scan three model. So if, for example, you had a revenue uh, model, then most likely you want to keep a revenue model for the other course values, yeah. for example, right? So with kind of these practices in mind. So uh, again, if you kind of want to be more, I don't know, like you want to think about it more, you want to plan more for it, you can think about that that question if you want to customize that, uh, the schema. But if you prefer that, you know, to start with something and then see from there, you can just choose the out of the box uh, uh, models. So that's kind of the, I guess, the second part of like the checklist, like plan your yeah. course convert your schemas basically. Yeah. Then the third part, again, if you want to be like the first uh, mover, like early adopters, is you can actually speak with uh, your media uh, partners, right? Just ask what's their, how, how they're doing with the progress towards Scan yeah. Four now. We speak with all the partners. Each one ha- are in their own kind of uh, process. Some of them mm-hmm. have okay. better programs already that some of our yeah, customers okay. are using and testing side by side. Others mm-hmm. are taking okay. it more slowly. So it really depends on the mm-hmm. media partner. But you know, if you're working with someone, you're spending a lot there, you can ask them, when are they planning to be ready with Scan4? Maybe they will tell you, you know yeah. what? We actually already have a better program. Yeah. We'll be happy to test Let's it out. Let's try it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Okay. So that's kind of, I guess, the initial checklist that I would. Uh, okay, um, okay, think okay, about. okay. Now it's uh, it's gonna be a lot of uh, a lot of fun, uh, I guess. Mm-hmm. Do you, yeah. Well, it, I, as you said at the beginning, I guess it kind of still is like three months out uh, until like eighty percent of the the users is actually having the the sixteen point one um, iOS. Yep. So there is mm-hmm. some time. Mm-hmm. But I guess the thing is, like, I guess you're never going to be like 100% prepared for what's going to happen. <laughs> you're right. And yeah. honestly, I, I tried like so many conversion schemas before. Um, mm-hmm. It's just like I was trying to be the early adopter and it, it took a long time until I figured it out. So now I'm, I'm in that like wait and see kind of mode. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's already, I guess, uh, time to start looking into things. Uh, right. 
Yeah, no, I think it's a definitely, uh, I think it's a very valid strategy to kind of wait and see. But uh, yeah. it depends on, the, you know, again, many are trying to use that as an opportunity to get an advantage early oh, on and kind of create the expertise. Nobody really knows how yeah. it's going to work like this kind of for. So if, yeah, so if kind of, if you feel that you want to kind of take the leap and yes, you probably need to iterate and kind of try to oh. learn it and make mistakes for sure. But you, you'll kind of gain maybe like a six months advantage over everyone else and be True. able to use that in your campaign strategy, which is pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty, uh, of course. Uh, and as I still <laughs> see some, some bigger and smaller companies, they don't even, they don't even run any iOS UA because, well, it's hard to, we can't even evaluate. Yeah, sure. Of course. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please don't do that. They, I, at least it's less competition <laughs> on iOS. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, yeah. I guess, it's I guess, really yes, painful it's... for me to hear. Yeah. Have these cases I hear. Yeah. We, we just gave up on iOS. You're not going to spend there, but yeah. yeah, it's just leaving room for the others to, uh, you know, to, uh, yeah, take what's that's there. the thing. Like those, those uh, iOS whales and payers, they just, they didn't disappear. They're still there. Of course, it's kind of hard to, to get them to, to play your game, but scan, scan 4 could definitely help. Could definitely help. Uh, so you mentioned at the beginning that you might be able to see some ad set uh, level data, some creative level data, any anything more more than maybe, because it's still pretty unsure that if you can. So if right. if yeah. you know more, please share. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> really curious. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's try to break it down. So it's around the deeper granularity, and it's associated mm -hmm. with one of the also very interesting features of Scan4 that Apple called the source identifier. So mm -hmm. the cool thing is, you know, in older versions, uh, Scan had uh, uh, kind of to represent where the user came from. You can then call like the network name. So we know that the user came yep. from Facebook as an example and a campaign ID, which was just a number between one and 100. So basically two digit number. Um, yep. And that made things difficult for the network side because it's not a lot of room to optimize and understand, okay, how, uh, basically, you know, how, how the segments basically of the users and how granular they are. So it led to, you know, many channels uh, saying, you know, we can run up to eight campaigns per account, for example, and they can't run more than more than that in scan campaigns, or that they could only show campaign level statistics. Maybe with some modeling, they could show some, you know, ad set level uh, uh, data. So it really depends. Um, but it basically, because you only have 100 options, I like think even about like country level data. If you run a global yeah. campaign, like everywhere yeah. uh, for a global audience, it's, it's let's say you try to split it by country and the ideas, it's, it's pretty tough to manage with only 100 values. Yeah. And so it's a problem for the network. So now we scan for it, kind of Apple redesigned it and called it the source identifier. And they basically said, again, based on kind of the backward compatible uh, design, they're saying in the source identifier, you always get, first of all, two g digits which you, you would always have. So it's kind of like equivalent to the campaign ID that you had before. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have the option to get an additional two digits depending on volume. So if you run at a certain scale, you get more than campaign ID granularity, you get mm -hmm. also another digit and then, and then another digit. So total of four different digits. It's like 10,000 different combinations of where the user came from. Mm -hmm. So that leaves a lot of flexibility for the ad network to decide what they want to know about where the user came from. They came from a specific ad set, really, from a specific ad, maybe from specific videos that you're running. You have 10,000 mm -hmm. different options. That's a lot, right? So that's yeah. pretty good news. Um, why is the maybe thing here? Why is it yeah. uh, with the caveat? Again, the good news, bad news. So good news, I have up to 10,000 options. You can map it to different creatives, different ad sets, mm -hmm. maybe different placements. Great. Bad news is it depends on your volume. By default, mm. you're only going to get that two digits, which is the same yeah. as you have today. Only mm. if you get to enough daily installs, and that's still a question mark, how many uh, you need, then okay. you would be exposed with more granularity. So you um, need to pass the privacy threshold, which is now going to be named as what crowd anonymity or whatever is, is that uh, exactly. bullshit? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> another uh, kind of uh, near terminal. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Another com- kind of... complexity into the the whole iOS. For okay, sure, so yeah. that's so why basically... maybe. Okay, so mm, all yes. right now I understand. So that's the maybe. So they've redesigned. Pro- no more privacy thresholds. Now only crowd anonymity tiers. And the more tiers you pass, the more data that you get. Um, yeah. Okay. And that's why. Like my personal guess is probably only the large scale advertisers would be able to get more granularity yeah. because they're running at scale. And you know, if they need more than just like a campaign level, obviously True, yeah. everyone needs more than a campaign level, but they would have enough volume to get more details such as yeah, know, to potentially scale even creative more. or placement or whatever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. No, no, no. That makes, that makes total sense. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Now, now it all clicks actually. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I think we could we could spend another like fifty, hundred, two hundred minutes, whatever, <laughs> on sure. Scan yeah. four point yeah. mm-hmm. But as soon as we hit the adoption rate and I have more uh, campaigns running on Scan four point I'm definitely want you back, and we were gonna discuss like what's what's happening in let's say in in a couple of months. So, yep, for sure. Thank thank you very much for coming. This was really good, and I kind of got what I what I wanted from the let's say uh actionable point of view so I know like what should I do and I hope our listeners know as well so uh yeah thank you very much for listening Aaron if our listeners want to connect contact you can you give us some uh contact details if they yeah, have of course. Some questions <laughs> yeah so um you know you can contact me at LinkedIn you know Ron Friedman from Singular feel free to uh connect with me I mean, also on all the Slack channel, community Slack channels yeah, there, nice. like, you know, NDM and such. We have also a mobile attribution privacy Slack channel. Uh, happy to connect there. Uh, yeah, either on Twitter or LinkedIn uh, or nice. even send me an email around at singer.net. And I'm uh, always happy to connect and chat for hours about scan, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> happy to talk. Nice. <laughs> This was amazing. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, our listeners, thank you very much for listening. Please share um, the podcast with our industry friends, uh, dogs and cats. <laughs> they love Scan 4.0. Uh, jokes aside, no. Thank you very much. Uh, see you next time. Cheers. Bye-bye.